Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, we're going to be discussing Bill Cheel. Bill joined the army in 1939 and fought throughout the whole war. He was evacuated through Dunkirk, fought in the desert, took part in the invasion of Sicily and in 1944 landed on Gold Beach on D-Day. He saw a lot of action. Bill wrote his memoirs, which had been edited by his son Paul and published as Fighting Through from Dunkirk to Hamburg, a Green Howard's wartime memoir. But just before we get started, I'd like to remind you all this podcast is made possible by the kind support of patrons who help fund the show via PayPal or Patreon. Patreon.com allows me to set up funding goals which help you see what I'd like to achieve and what your support helps me with. At the time of me talking to you now, I'm just a few dollars short of my first funding goal of $250. When I reach that target, I'm going to invest in increasing my hosting package, so hopefully making it easier to potentially deliver longer podcasts. As a thank you to all those who listen, when I reach that target, I have a special extra episode ready to be released looking at the Covenanter tank. So if you'd like to become a patron of the show, it's easy. Go to www2podcast.com and click on donate or patreon.com slash www2podcast. And it's a big thank you as ever to all those who already support the show. So Paul, thanks for joining me. It's been a long time in coming has our chat. I got my mother your book uh, for Christmas and my family have been reading it ever since. So <laughs> let's start in 1939. Your father, William Cheel, volunteered for the army. Why? What what motivated him? I guess I guess war must have been on the uh, on the horizon. Yes. I think that was it really. He felt that there was going to be trouble and he said he'd rather take his future into his own hands and decide how he wanted to proceed rather than it just being imposed upon him. So uh, I think it was April 1939, he signed up with the 6th Green Howards as a territorial. That was some like six months or so before they were actually called up to uh, to fight. Why did he select? I mean, it's Middlesbrough he joins up, so he could you know, conceivably gone into the Navy, he could have gone into the Durham Light Infantry. Why did he? Because he seems very loyal to the Green Howards throughout the war. Why did he choose the Green Howards? Is there some sort of family connection, or was it just the local regiment? It wasn't a family connection. There was a depot in Middlesbrough for the Green Howards, and I guess uh, he and several pals all decided that was the place to go. So the area uh, that governed the Green Howards was it was the Tyne and Tees, which was where the badge for the uh, 50th Division came from. It was the TT, the Rivers Tyne and Tees, and indeed Humber. And that was the capture area. Uh, so the the Durham Light Infantry were just slightly further north, I guess. And uh, the Green Hours was the one that was the logical place to go, basically. It, we'll get to this later, but it, it does abuse me how frightfully loyal to the Green Howards he is. <laughs> Oh, incredibly so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they had a proud fighting history and uh, Dad took that on board. All clad and sinker. I mean, I got the feeling that he felt that when he's eventually shipped, he wasn't particularly well trained. The original training they did was really just square bashing and hiking and marching and they did very little training with equipment. Um, I'm sure at one point he'll have had a, a wooden gun like all the rest of them did. I think eventually he got trained on a, a real rifle. But yeah, I know he remarked on when when they were over at Dunkirk that as part of the expeditionary force that officers only had revolvers and binoculars and a, I think a compass if they'd supplied their own. And if they couldn't supply their own, they didn't have them. And they were devoid of so many weapons. It was ridiculous, really. Well, when he gets shipped to France, as a point, makes a point of, you know, they're, they're issued Bren guns and anti-tank guns, which no one had fired. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which somehow seems, especially the, you know, the Bren, it's, you know, it's a close infantry support weapon sort of thing. You would, one would have might have thought before they were shipped, uh, they'd had some, someone would have had some training on them. You would. 
And uh, but I think initially they didn't even have those things. But there you go. So they shipped to France in you know, April 1940. So the Germans you know, really it started in May, doesn't it? The Battle of France. But April 1940, you know, how how did they find France? Was it exciting? It must have been you know a different world for them. Well, having signed up in the April of 39, I think it was the August 39 when he was called up at a told to return to headquarters as it were and of course war was declared it was september the 3rd 1939 so it was april 1940 when he he went over there there wasn't a lot going on really they went over there to as a labor battalion because they weren't really a proper fighting battalion they were there just to uh, lay bricks and in fact to create an airstrip for the raf so there's a lot of laying of concrete. And that, was, of course, was the period of the phony war. But uh, while he was in France, there was some bombing and strafing took place and one or two expeditions to hunt out infiltrators, the uh, so-called fifth column. Broadly speaking, they were working in overalls every day. And, you know, they weren't a fighting battalion by any stretch of the imagination until May the 10th. When they when they attack us, but at this point, he, 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 he's the Batman to to a major patch. Now, for those people who don't know, what what is a Batman? What was his duties? He basically looked after the officers every his every need. He'd bring him a, a cup of tea in the morning. Uh, he'd iron his uniform, wash, do his laundry, make sure he was turned out as an officer was expected to turn out, and just be a, his is close support mechanism. So it's almost like his manservant. I'm not sure they agree uh, happen in other armies. <laughs> it's, it's quite essentially English, doesn't it? It does, but I think manservant is a good description for it. Did he, do you think he enjoyed it? Oh, he did thoroughly enjoy it. He learnt a lot from him as well. I think uh, my dad was at that time a working class background and to discover how officers lived and uh, what sort of habits and customs they had. I think he learnt a lot on that front but he had a huge respect for the major because he knew that he cared deeply about the troops welfare and no end of times he he did things which made dad realize how much he cared i know there was one point at which the the troops had nothing to eat and the the major gave one of the uh, troops some money who went into the local village and bought up all the bread supplies and and brought that back so they had something to eat but uh, yeah, he was a tower of strength. I think was the phrase Dad used at one point. Tower of strength. Well, this this well this is where it gets us to the uh, you know, the end of the Forney War and the, the, the Germans the Germans attack and, and the British Ex- expeditionary force goes into rapid retreat. Um, now, how was that retreat for your your father? It, it, it doesn't seem to be a collapse in morale. No, I think. Uh... Northeastern lads were made of stern stuff and they weren't going to uh, take anything lying down. And I, I do believe the fighting strengths were uh, proven at that period and later on in the war. Obviously, this was the, the Nazi blitzkrieg where suddenly relatively untrained troops found themselves fighting for their lives against the seasoned German full-timers only armed with rifles and a, and a few other things they they managed to hold back the onslaught and uh, dad never used the word rear guard but i think there was at times when he was part of the rear guard because he talks about plugging gaps in the front wherever they were called upon and he literally went all over the place fighting and then retreating and then fighting some more and eventually making their way back to dunkirk where at that point other troops were taking uh, taking on the role of the rear guard. As I said when I read it, he, he seems optimistic. There seems to be no real... He never seems to come across as a, there's any breakdown in, in command. But what he does seem to be is confused. And as you say, you know, at one point he writes he had no rations for 15 days, and hence Major Petch you know, purchasing the bread. It, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't quite come across as... The out and out route that uh, sort of we have in, in in mind when you hear the word route. <laughs> no, I, I agree, and I think it was the fact that Dad used the phrase a few times, uh, which is grim determination. That you know, when all when all seems lost, you keep your chin up and you keep on fighting to survive. And I get the impression morale was always pretty good uh, amongst the troops. 
certainly how it portrays it. And how, so, you know, they get to Dunkirk. I mean, for many people, you know, the, yeah, the, the images is, it, it's strange for me. It's a mixed image of, of the film, I think, with a Messerschmitt roaring down the, roaring down the beach, uh, and long lines of, long lines of, of men. How was your father's experience at Dunkirk? Well, when he finally got to the beach, uh, after the fighting that led to him arriving there, it was chaos. It's funny because they walked around this quiet corner uh, just arriving at Bray Doon, which is just down the road from Dunkirk. And suddenly they, they came across the beach and saw either way they looked tens of thousands of troops. And uh, in fact, at that point, the Stuckers had just been over doing some bombing and strafing. And there were lads dead and wounded all over the place. And the uh, medics were doing their best at to make the best of a bad job in, in looking after the ones that had been wounded. But it was it was chaos because uh, nobody knew what was going on. There's a, a lot of disorganisation. But luckily, the majority of Dad's unit had, had kept together. I think the numbers that actually arrived at Dunkirk, they'd been depleted earlier by the fighting, but the number that did arrive stuck together and Major Petch took a leading role there and managed to, after a, a day or so, managed to uh, find them a place on the Lady of Man, which is a ferry ship, and they had to walk five or six miles along the thick, heavy sands from Bredoon to Dunkirk to get on it. But it was awful because they had to take shelter in the meantime in the sand dunes, and that was the best place to hide, really, from the, the onslaught. But obviously some troops weren't in the sand dunes, they were just on the beach, and everybody felt very exposed. Even today, if you take a Google map or a Google Earth view of the sand dunes at Bray Dunes, you, you can pretty much still make out bomb craters. You know, it's, it's pretty horrendous stuff, really. Yeah, he's one of the 300,000 to, 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 to get off at Dunkirk. And, and one of those curious things that, again, sort of, it gets sort of skipped over, um, you bring 300,000, an army, back from uh, France... Uh, you deposit them all in the country. They don't come back in neat regiments. They don't come back with everything they were sent with. They're essentially got off the boats as fast as possible. You can't just have 300,000 men deposited in in, uh, in Dover. So it's basically in the clothes he's stood up with, he's stuffed on a train. All he came back with was some bedraggled clothing, obviously, and his bayonet, which, uh, interestingly, is actually on display or has been on display at the Green Howards Museum in Richmond um, but yeah very little was taken back to Dunkirk and dad ended up with uh, again thankfully in his case the majority of his unit in uh, Cardiff it's sort of a holding point really is Cardiff for, for them isn't there as they trying to f I guess there's a huge administrative job as they're piecing together where everybody is before they can pull them all together yeah they had to carefully go through who people were because there was always a possibility of infiltrators being in their midst as well so everybody had to be accounted for in the official records and then eventually they were resupplied and moved back or moved on to wherever they were destined to be. So there's a lovely story of your father and two old ladies in Cardiff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. if you ever wanted a, a great tale of the Dunkirk spirit, that, that is one of them because Dad, in the, probably the first day he got back or the day after he got back, uh, he was wandering the streets of Cardiff because at this point there was nothing going on apart from uh, disorganised recovery. He was wandering around Cardiff and he was looking at an advert in a newsagent's window and two ladies uh, came up to him because at this point he was dressed, he still had his hard hat on and they came up to him and uh, asked him if he'd been, uh, if he'd just come back from Dunkirk and he said, well, yes. And they kindly invited him back to their houses and over the course of two or three days, he, he met them a few times and went for dinner with them and told them all about Dunkirk. Um, and they were very sort of circumspect about asking him because they didn't know how traumatised he was and whether he'd really want to talk about it. So, I mean, my dad was a, a pretty tough character, actually. As, and going back to your earlier question, all those North Eastern boys were, were tough lads. And, uh, you know, he, he was OK. So he talked about it and uh, they gave him a lot of kindness. And uh, in fact, they, they wept when they heard the story of, of everything that, that had been going on. It's a very touching story, you know, inviting him round for, for, for tea. Yeah, and they offered him money and all sorts, but uh, so it was very kind, yeah. 
they rejoin uh, their units. The unit reforms, sort of, as it were, back in Dorset. The administration captures up with him, and he rejoins his whole unit. And uh, you know, presumably, they start refitting and retraining. Uh, and Petch, Petch is is he retired off? Yeah, around this point, uh, they were based around the Bournemouth area, particularly. And uh, during that period, Major Petch was retired because. It turned out that he'd been in the First World War as well and he'd suffered damage to his hearing and I think it was felt, because he, he was obviously older years, he wasn't, wasn't a spring chicken anymore. And I think he was retired through, uh, well, not ill health, but you know, with, with shattered hearing, he wasn't going to really do that well later on in the war with what was to come. So he uh, he stood down and things moved on. The next... the. They're off to the Middle East. Middle East. I was in retrospect, he gets lucky, but he comes out with sinusitis, so he can't be shipped out with his unit. I mean, I wondered if he felt himself, you know, subsequently lucky to have not been shipped out with his unit. Oh, my goodness, yeah, absolutely. Um, when the battalion was shipping out, he, as you said, he had sinusitis. He had to go for an operation in hospital. Uh, so he, he missed the boat, and... Uh, what was to lay in store for the rest of the battalion was some serious fighting and a lot of death. And chances are he wouldn't have come through that had he, he gone. So uh, luckily he stayed behind and cooled his heels till the next opportunity to go to Africa came about. He's posted to uh, Richmond, which is the uh, headquarters of the Green Howard. That's Richmond in North Yorkshire, not Surrey. <laughs> uh, uh, and... It's at this point, this is well, it's one of those strange, I have a lovely question for you later, but he's, um, he becomes an officer's cook. Yes, I think partly because of his association with officers as, as Major Petch's Batman, when they were looking around for someone to, to do stuff, uh, and Dad was, at this point, a seasoned veteran, and a lot of the troops there were greenhorns undergoing training, and Dad would really have just become a bored soldier had he stayed doing more and more training. So, yeah, he took he was given the opportunity to be an officer's cook, and he took that with relish, with no previous experience. Um, but he went on a course, and thereafter, throughout the war, he, he dipped in and out of this role. You know, when he wasn't fighting with the lads, he would he would serve up grub to the officers. I think during that period, he also became a, a waiter as well. There's one funny anecdote from that period when uh, he used to serve one particular officer in the officer's mess in the morning, breakfast time, and he'd and the officer would say to him, oh, I'll have the usual chill, and he didn't mean bacon and eggs, he meant the double whiskey. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I was quite surprised that they sort of seemingly randomly pick him to be the officer's cook without sort of any previous... <laughs> experience that you know you go on a quick course and suddenly you're expected to be producing officer class food i know i know um luckily dad and the nice thing for dad was that he was the officer's cook and not like having to cook for five million troops presumably if you're cooking for a lot of troops you, you have you know the regimental cookbook which i have a second world war cookbook and it's relatively slim thing now your dad mentions that he, he carried with him a copy of mrs beaton's and presumably that's mrs beaton's household management if it's anything that's like my mother's yeah. 1930s version yeah. is probably brig bigger than a house brick. oh it is it's massive it, it, sadly i haven't got his original copy but i actually bought one on ebay and uh, <laughs> so it's, it's enormous it must have filled half his pack had he been engaged in trench warfare at any point and he has been able to stand on that to give him a better view of the enemy but uh the, the nice thing about that book is actually i discovered in the middle of it some uh some little diagrams for folding napkins into different shapes Oh, is everything in it? Uh, absolutely everything. But the I irony of or the coincidence behind that is that in his box of tricks, or his souvenirs and everything, I found those self same sheets of paper with the which he'd already he had, he'd obviously torn them out of his original book to keep them, and then I, I found them and matched them up with the one I'd bought on eBay. Obviously, I've therefore got now got two copies of those things. It was a nice, nice. It was a nice find. It, yeah. It's nice to know that that's the version he had, and it's an enormous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and eventually it's um, the end of nineteen forty-two. He's shipped to 
the Middle East. But he has the... He receives the dreadful news that he, he's going to be posted to the to the East Yorks Regiment, East Yorkshire Regiment, which, you know, to, to anybody not familiar with British geography, is a whole ooh, 70 miles away from the Green Howards. But to him, it might as well be, you know, New York Regiment, you know, the Americans. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure why. I think really he was just part of a draft going out there and they were being treated as substitutes to replace vacancies in, in the other battalions. The logic of the 5th East Yorks, of course, was that the 5th East Yorks and the 6th and 7th Green Howards together made up the 69th Brigade. Uh, so there was there was a connection between them. But yeah, Dad was most distraught when he was lined up and told he was now in the 5th East Yorks. He never did actually get the badge to go with it, strangely enough. Not so long past that, he was recognised by an officer and he said, you're chill, aren't you? And he recognised him from the officer's mess in Richmond. And he said, well, what are you doing with a... What are you doing with Fifth East Yorks? And, and Dad explained. So the officer turned to his adjutant and said, "This man is a Green Howard. Transfer him immediately." So, so Dad thankfully ended up back where he, he felt he belonged. I, th- I thought that was a wonderful story. The ignominy of uh, being d- d- put in the East Yorks. What, what was his impressions of the Middle East when he got there? Flies is the first word that comes to mind. It was very hot, sandy. Sand got in everything. And he said the flies were just appalling. The the food when they first got there, because he, uh, he had a wonderful voyage on the Queen Mary, he landed at Ch- uh, Port Trufic, and uh, then moved over to a, a camp called Kassassin Camp, which is uh, every soldier's bugbear in the Middle East, apparently, because it was full of flies. The food was absolutely appalling. And initially, Dad lost a lot of weight because he just couldn't eat it. It was like runny green mashed potato that, didn't taste like anything but the flies landed on your lips and you know everything you drank and ate there were flies around your mouth so that that was his impression really nothing to do with the fighting because initially there wasn't any fighting he uh he did uh, a training course on a bren gun carrier which is fantastic and also the at periods he was guarding german troops as well there's an interesting story out of that i was just about to say how did he find the germans he was uh, accompanied them guard duty going out on working parties and there were a couple of young german lads just ordinary german infantry alfred becker and another chap and they befriended dad as, as i suspect prisoners try to but he he returned the compliment and uh, he realized they were just ordinary lads and he used to give them uh, bits of chocolate or treats if he found them occasionally and he actually helped them write home to their parents to let them know they were okay Al- alfred decker's parents were eternally grateful and wrote back and thanked dad for his help and enclosed in their letter their only photograph of their son which was rather touching and i've still got that photograph in amongst dad's box of tricks today have you ever tried to track them down i have actually made fair efforts to uh, to do it I, I found alfred decker's gravestone uh, funnily enough he died age 75 uh, so he had a good in, in the 1980s i think it was so he had a good uh, a good life uh, his family name was borzinski and that's pretty much all i know i haven't been able to track anything more than that one of these days, I'll write to a German newspaper, I think, and give them the story and see what they can do with it. Your, your father, when he rejoins the Green Howards, is there many familiar faces? No, there are relatively few, because, uh, as I alluded to earlier, they were involved in the Battle of Gaza, uh, at which point a lot of them got killed, and the uh, the ranks were split asunder, really. So when Dad got back, he ended up in a different company, and uh, I think there was only one chap he recognised, as he observed at one point in the book that pals came and went in the army, especially during the war. And there are names at the beginning of his book that by the end of the book, he'd lost tra- track of them or they were dead or whatever. And I guess he uh, he soon made some fresh pals. But I think it really hit him hard to realise what might have been had he gone out. Mm, and he he comes under fire again himself in in the desert in uh, f- forty three, 
I mean, how was that compared to France? I think it was a different battle because Dunkirk was fought over several days, whereas the battle you're talking about was April 43. That was the Battle of Wadi Akarit, which was a horrendous battle, but that was over, like, as I say, a 24-hour period. But there was some serious fighting went on there. They gathered at the uh, beginning of the battle on this flat plain devoid of trees, and uh, the point was that the the enemy were ensconced in some hills on the horizon. And that was like the last major battle that took place in North Africa. And it was the Germans and the Italians retreating further north in Tunisia to uh, eventually get out of the country and and leave North Africa. But the battle began and uh, the troops had to walk in a line across this flat plain under uh, shell fire and all sorts and several yards apart to uh, minimise the damage of shelling. As they approached these these hills, the uh, shelling intensity increased. There were lads being wounded and killed and blown to bits left, right and centre. Certainly several of his pals got killed in that battle. But they eventually made it into the hills and came across the enemy, and there was a lot of hard fighting during that point. But eventually the Allies won. His Lance Corporal's killed at some point, isn't he? Is that the way he jumps up and up and at him himself? That was uh, Lance Corporal Coughlin. At one point they'd been told to keep their heads down because being in the hills, the enemy were more often than not above them, so they could they had a vantage point to see what they were doing. And at one point, for some reason, Corporal Coughlin jumped up to see what was going on and Dad was sitting right next to him, standing right next to him. He got shot by a sniper and just fell fell dead there and then as a consequence of that the uh, soldiers really got angry with the enemy my dad at that point was the senior soldier so he he took took charge and he shouted out to the rest of his comrades to attack and don't forget your grenades boys so they uh, ran up to this italian trench and they found a a lot of Italian soldiers hiding there, cowering, and they're the ones who'd shot their pal. At this point, I don't think there was any taking of prisoners because when you're in the middle of a battle, you either kill or be killed, and so they killed the Italians. Is the bottom line there? It got me because, insofar as he's, you know, you, you kind of read his jovial things about being an officer's cook and this, that, and the other, and then you get to this little bit, and it's there's that sort of. Uh, it's almost like something snaps, and he he's up he is up and at them. Uh, something snaps him, and he's 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 gone. He's you know the aggression kicks in. I think it was uh, there were extremes definitely from long periods of being browned off, as Dad referred to it, uh, to the intensity of of a vicious battle. Yes, it brought out all the extremes of emotion that it possibly could. Such a glut, glutton for punishment. You know, his next up is, is Husky. He, they take part in uh, Husky, the invasion of Sicily, uh, and and more than anything else, what what made me chuckle about that? He notes that he, uh, or in my notes, I'm, I think I must have read it in the book. He, he, he he's uh, he caters for Eisenhower and Monty. Yeah, that was an extension <laughs> of his officer's cook duties. Yeah, having having landed at Avila in Sicily for the landing uh, and gone through various battles on the island uh things had gone quiet and i think at this point monty was having a a meal with some of the the high ups and uh one day was dad was asked to prepare a a meal for for that for these people he didn't know at the time he was preparing it that it was monty and the rest of them but uh it was only after that he he discovered it but he, he recalls being taken in a jeep uh, with the wind flying through his hair around all the local shops trying to get uh, supplies to make this meal. That's a fantastic uh, one to tell your kids that story, isn't it? I cook for Eisenhower and Monty. Absolutely. It's funny, but I, I found a picture because when, when you go through the web, you do keep your eye open for things. And uh, I found a picture with Monty meeting all these other senior officers. And that was on the date that Dad cooked this meal. So obviously that picture relates to this occasion so that was rather nice it's one of those things you eventually keep looking you'll probably find a picture of them all eating uh, yeah, yeah absolutely did, yeah, yeah did he ever know what he cooked them no no it was i think to be fair dad 
did one course. It was uh, he did the hors d'oeuvres. So this is where uh, I, mean, I I think Monty basically shafts them and decides that he needs his his, his crack troops from the desert in Sicily. And your father's withdrawn, so he misses Italy, misses the invasion of Italy. They're withdrawn back to the UK. I mean, I'm guessing he doesn't realise he's what he's why he's been withdrawn back to the UK. No, I think they probably had an inkling that it was for better things, but they clearly had no idea exactly what. In fact, even the fact that it was France, Dad only knew it was France when he was on the ship going over there. What what surprised me was. Uh, they do go through a rigorous training program in in the UK. I was not sort of aware that the the infantry were were put through such a rigorous training program pre D Day. I think it depends which battalion you were in. I know the Green Howards were designated as being part of the first wave on Gold Beach, and as a result, they were going to be in the forefront of all any fighting that took place. Oh, that was the view. And as a result, they were given a higher level of training, I suspect, than a lot of the troops were. He went up to Scotland, to Inverary, and uh, he was given a commando training course. I think he was there two or three weeks, and they were doing all sorts of things, climbing ropes and uh, practicing uh, landings on landing craft. Goodness knows what else. And this would be the first time, presumably, for, well, at least a year, because he was in, in, in the Middle East, that he... he get some leave at home how does he find home it must be a different place presumably people have people have been killed and bombed and he came back i think it was it was bonfire night uh, when he came back he arrived at liverpool and uh, the troops were in awe of the violence that had taken place and obviously liverpool had been heavily bombed so he found it to a degree a subdued place i guess so uh, the worst thing about coming home was that he he had to go and see the parents of several of his comrades that had been killed. Uh, there was Arthur Oxley and two or three others. He found that quite a hard task because he had to uh, not necessarily break the news to them, but you know be one of the first there to see the parents to to share in their sorrow. I thought that was uh, a remarkably. A decent, but a sort of almost brave thing to do, because it must have been a horrendous sort of duty going to see them. It would have been very easy to stay away, wouldn't it? Yeah, find an excuse. But I, th- I think they were pals that he was close to, and I guess he knew the parents as well. So uh, that made it even harder, I suspect. I think the worst one actually was the one that I mentioned, uh, Arthur Oxley, because he got blown to bits in uh, the Battle of Wadi Akarit. And uh, my dad had to bury him. And he, in doing that, he found the shell-damaged cap badge of Arthur. And that today remains in the souvenirs that dad's left. So that was that was quite tragic. Well, that must have been horrific as well, but, but, but you're burying your friends. I mean, it was parts of bodies as well that he was burying. It wasn't it wasn't recognisable as a as a person, to be honest. But luckily, he, they buried him under a mound of a cairn of stones. Dad marked the spot and reported the, the burial location. And thankfully, Arthur's body was recovered later on. And he's now buried uh, in one of the official Commonwealth War grave cemeteries. The next big thing is D-Day. And, and, and you know, he, he writes, uh, we, were, we were at the beginning, we were at the beginning of a never-to-be-forgotten experience. Indeed, making history... And he's obviously writing that years later with with huge enthusiasm. Uh, there, there doesn't appear to be any any war weariness. And he's writing that, you know, the day they're going out, you know, they're, they're, they're going to the docks, they know they're going to do something. No, no war weariness. I think it was an opportunity that they'd been waiting for to finally deliver the enemy a heavy blow. And it, it was payback time to a degree. And... Of course, the Americans were were all looking to avenge Pearl Harbor. The Canadians had things to avenge. And obviously the British had Dunkirk to avenge and all the rest of it. And I think they were all of a, a firm mind that, you know, we're going to give some payback here. That made them enthusiastic about it. Yeah, and how, how does his D-Day go? He survived, which is a good thing. <laughs> so excellent in that respect. He went over 
from Southampton on the Empire Lance. Uh, it was one of several ships tailor-made for the invasion, American-built. Seven miles, I think it was, from shore, they disembarked and got onto landing craft. They took two hours to get to shore. Uh, they were, As I said earlier, they were in the first wave on Gold Beach. As they approached the shore, the helmsman was counting down the distance. Certainly at that point, one landing craft was blown to smithereens. When they stopped, it was about four feet of water, and they jumped off a landing craft under fire. I know that the uh, soldier in front and behind of Dad was shot dead as Dad was jumping off, and, you know, that sort of made Dad get his skates on and, and run, run up the beach. There was uh, dead lads all over the place, really. It was horrendous getting off the beach. There was a, a disabled German tank standing there with flails all blasted to smithereens, and behind it there was uh, Captain Lynn, uh, who was a, a well-respected officer. He was urging the troops to get off the beach. He'd already been wounded, but then he was shot and killed and one of Dad's other officers took over, Captain Chambers, and he was shouting to the troops, get off the beach, lads, off the bloody beach and give the buggers hell. The troops ran up the beach and finally cleared the major obstacles. And at that point, the, the firing died down because they were out of harm's way. Shortly after that, they, they sort of regrouped and, and carried on with the fighting. There's a story when, when Dad was on, on Gold Beach, there was a chap called... Rufty Hill when they were getting off the landing craft. He jumped off the landing craft and fell into a shell hole. So as a result, instead of landing in four feet of water, he went down deep and at the same time the craft surged forward on a wave and crushed him and obviously drowned him. And that was it. That was his uh, D-Day, which is really, really sad because uh, yeah, he was a tough soldier and, and well-liked by everybody he was one of the lads as dad described it um so that that was uh, rather a one of those unfortunate accidents it was it was that happens yeah and it, it's a long day for them they don't eat for 18 hours i mean that's what sort of you suddenly think it brings it home how long a day it is for them and especially the two hours two hours coming in on a boat, presumably they're all being sick. Yes. He does make a point of you know, noting they, they needed sick bags. That must be exhausting. They'd uh, had a breakfast on the Empire Lance, and obviously that didn't go down well, or it didn't stay down well uh, when they were <laughs> travelling over on the landing craft, because the sea was very choppy, and, uh, yeah, that did its worst. But they had, um, I think they had... 24-hour rations with them so they had they probably had something to eat but i would imagine uh the excitement of the day was you know the last thing they were worried about i guess was eating it was about staying alive at that point and it's continual you know it must be continual combat it, it makes part of you know, noting they didn't have a wash or a shower for 24 days so they must have been in the line for at least 24 days yes yeah um that would have taken us to the end of the month really it's funny at that point dad was uh sitting at the edge of a, a ditch having uh, a bite to eat in fact at that point he got wounded a shell came over and they hadn't heard it and the next thing dad knew he'd been thrown several yards across the road with a, a piece of shrapnel in the side of his leg it, 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 for him the you know, the evacuate his his personal evacuation from from you know backwards <laughs> down the chain is quite an efficient process of of uh you know, taking him away, and he eventually, you know, well, how, well, you know, describe the route that he takes. Pretty quickly after he'd been wounded, a first aid jeep came up, and Dad was stretched onto the back of it with some other chap, and they were taken to a holding bay, uh, and from there they were taken across the Mulberry Harbour, because this was four weeks later after D-Day. Uh, so at this point, the Mulberry Harbour was ready. He went across it and he, he remarks that uh, he looked up to see this magnificent piece of construction as he went across it. he never forget it. Um, but he was whisked across the channel. When he got back to England, he was operated upon. He, he stayed at the Canadian General Hospital. It was a temporary hospital that had been set up. And at that point, he was operated upon. Shrapnel was taken out, handed it, handed to him on a handkerchief, 
which again that piece of shrapnel is in his box of souvenirs <laughs> so, it's funny because uh, occasionally i do talks on dad's book and i went to a school once and i put a slide up of this piece of shrapnel so kids could see what it was and just to scale this i'd put a 50 pence next to it on the on the screen and uh, some little kid said when when they took the shrapnel out is that when they found the 50 pence as well <laughs> so, you know innocence <laughs> but he seems quite t- it, you know there's, there's various ways to go in hospital you know where you're, you're depressed but he doesn't he seems to have accepted accepted his wound he's quite chipper yes uh i know he was at dundee royal infirmary uh for his recuperation period during that period he had quite a lot of pain from the leg but gradually he he worked through it and uh, eventually he was well enough to return to uh, his regiment. Well, well yeah, this is where he is, though. He doesn't return to his regiment, does he? He has the ignominy of joining the East Lancashire Regiment, which is, you know, heavens above. It's on the wrong side of the country <laughs> that's, now. That's even worse than the East Yorks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, he, uh, he, he decided he wanted to go back to, to his pals and so volunteered to return when he was fit enough. And uh, yes, he, he suddenly found halfway across to where he was going that it wasn't destined for the Green Howards, but <laughs> to the first East Lancs. Because at this point, the Green Howards had been withdrawn. I think they'd got to a certain point in Germany and they were pulled back. So, yeah, first East Lancs. And uh, I don't think he had much fighting to do. He he ended up out on the outskirts of Hamburg. I think he referred to a few skirmishes here and there. But broadly speaking, he ended up on the outskirts of Hamburg uh, around about the time that the Germans surrendered. So when he went into Hamburg, it was a, a city that had surrendered and he joined the regimental police, which was effectively keeping the peace in the population. So something that I, 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 I did note, because it's something my dad sort of, obviously I was failed to recall really, for, for VE Day, you know, you, there's all kinds of famous pictures of, you know, London and people celebrating, but for him it was kind of just another day. My, my dad couldn't really remember VE Day at all. It, just another day that things had to be done. It was. It was an ordinary day for them. There was no celebration, not even a drink. In fact, I, I don't even think an officer stood up and uh, officially announced what had happened. I think it was one of these grapevine things because at the end of the day, they were they were at the front of the action, or so they thought. So I guess they were still on a you know quite a serious war footing. And to talk about uh, surrender wasn't necessarily a thing for major celebrations because they probably still thought. They had a lot of work to do. Yeah, I, I, it's one of those funny things that you know, because it, it's so it burnt into your into the sort of cultural psyche of people dancing in Leicester Square, and you, it's just so easy to remember that these guys, it, it was just nothing. It was just they had to carry on. <laughs> yeah, they certainly weren't doing jigs around the trenches. No, no, but there's no there's no conger in Dad's trench. <laughs> <laughs> but for your father. Uh, you know the f- the first in first out policy. This is where it kicks in for him. Uh, he'll be he'll have been one of the first to be demobilised, demobbed after six and a half years. You know, in later life, how did your father feel about the war? He remembered it with fond regard, really, because I think the rewards of the fighting were learning new stuff, learning how officers lived, learning how to cook, and uh, above all, the sheer camaraderie with his pals. And I think there were a lot of positives. Obviously, there were a lot of negatives as well. But uh, I guess you you tend to put the negatives behind, as we all do, and remember the positives. And that's how Dad saw the war. I remember as kids, because he was posted to Bournemouth for a period of time, he fell in love with the place. So as a result, when we were uh, kids as a family, we always used to holiday in Bournemouth and he would always be driving past one place or another and saying, oh, I was stationed there during the war, or, you know, this, that and the other. And uh, so, you know, he clearly had fond memories. Did he keep it, keep up with his uh, Green Howard's pals f- after the war? He didn't. I think he just got on with life, really. Before the war, he'd run a shop with his mother uh, a grocer's store and he went back to that to make a living in those days you know it was a hard living he was pretty much working six days a week i don't think he had a lot of time 
for socialising. It's funny, my fa- father never kept in contact really with his either. He he kept himself to himself, broadly speaking. He was quite a reserved chap, and I think also for that reason he didn't tend to get too involved. I think to a degree as well, Dad was at the sharp end so many times, he knew what a real war was like, whereas a lot of soldiers weren't. I don't think he necessarily had a lot in common with some of them. How did he feel about all those, that slew of war films that came out that were on every every weekend afternoon when you were kids? <laughs> oh, I think he liked them. I think he liked watching them. There was a news show that used to be on called All Our Yesterdays. That was all about the war, and he loved watching that. I remember watching that <laughs> as a kid. He did travel back in... Is it, uh, it'd be 95, was it? Uh, I don't know why I've written 94, but it must have been 95. It was 94, that was the 50th anniversary. Oh, was it the D-Day anniversary? D-Day anniversary, D-Day. yes, yes. And how did he find it? Uh, oh, he thoroughly enjoyed it. He uh, started off the day, really. We were looking, we were on the top of the promenade at Aramanche, and this great big American guy came up to him in a in a suit and like an earpiece and sunglasses and he asked Daz, asked dad what his business was you know what he what his interests were and dad explained that he'd been to uh d-day and all the rest of it and the uh, it turns out this guy was a member of the american secret service and, and they were reconnoitering the place before president reagan came to visit or so, some somebody important and uh, anyway he was so pleased to have met dad he shook his hand <laughs> And let, let let him go about his business. <laughs> it was a wonderful day, actually, because we went then to Bayer to the official ceremony, which was attended by the Duke of Edinburgh and the Queen, President Mitterrand. And the, the whole of Bayer was bedecked in flags and regalia. And the people there were so friendly, grateful for what the British had helped them with. And it was a really, really good atmosphere. And everybody was in a good mood. Uh, and there were there were marching bands on the beach. There was a you know an official march past, and they had all the old boats and uh, machinery up there. And it was altogether a fantastic time. And Dad was very touched by it, particularly the ceremony. I remember him, uh, you know, having tears in his eyes at the official ceremony. We, we went to Bayo with my father in probably eighty nine, and uh, I think I might have told this story before. But the um, as we we're going in this French guy came out and he said to my father you were here in 44 I went, oh yes I you know, landed in 44 and, and he said I was in the RAF and my because we're surrounded by bomber bases my dad reeled off all the bomber bases around here during the war uh, the, guy, the guy burst into tears hugged my dad who you know typical Yorkshireman left his arms down his side and didn't quite know what was going on and this Frenchman gave this big hug, floods of tears, and said, oh, we were young, and, and, and walked off, leaving my father completely embarrassed and bemused. <laughs> Wondering what had happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I only really have one, one, one sort of final thing. Right? See, he, he goes through the whole of the war. He fights in, you know, everywhere. He never... He really, Did he finish the war as a private? I don't think he... he he started as a private and he finished as a, a corporal in charge of the regimental police, which was uh, not the red caps, um, not the military police, but regimental police. So he was on duty patrolling various German cities from time to time, which was included Hamburg, Dusseldorf, two or three others. And he's got really happy memories of that period. It wasn't a, a tough job insofar as the German population weren't didn't seem resentful or or anything they were just quite subdued uh so they were pleased in fact that the allies had finally brought some stability i just find it yeah i find it amusing that or not amusing you know, he didn't actually get you know a, a further rank up or he didn't end up being an officer or you know because he was in at the start it's amazing that you got all the way through and uh part of that i think was his inclination not to want promotion there was at one point early in the war he was uh, asked if he would like to be interviewed for an officer's job and he went for the interview and uh, answered all the questions fairly well I think but he said at the end one of the final questions was did he have an independent income and he said no 
So, so therefore, I can't afford my own binoculars. <laughs> Bear that in mind. As a result of that, he felt that's why he got turned down. At that point, he decided he didn't want to become an officer. If that's what it took, that it had to be uh, you know, of independent means, then he would re- reject it. Uh, but I think as, as more and more officers got picked off during the war, I suspect they relaxed the rules to the point that it didn't really matter. But eventually, Dad was Lance Corporal, and then, as I say, Corporal on the, in charge of the regimental police. Yeah, sometimes I think regiments um, like the Green Howards, and is it the 51st Highlanders? were sort of shafted by Monty, who kept he kept requesting them after they'd performed so well in the desert. I wonder how many of them thought, oh, haven't we done enough? Let some other blight to have a go. Yeah, I think uh, there's a truth in that, but I think they had proved themselves at Dunkirk to be tough material, and as a result, result of that, they got onto the next peg, for ne- being chosen for the next tough battle, and because they performed well in that, they got chosen for D-Day, etc. Yeah, I don't think they were necessarily picked on by Monty, but they were they were his chosen boys to a degree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, this, uh, yes, and it was mentioned in the book, the fifty you know, the first Highlands, I think, did the same sort of thing. They end up fighting everywhere, and you think, oh bloody hell, could they not find somebody new? And knows there were a bit of garrison duty for a. For a short period. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There were a few times when Dad bemoaned the fact that they got pulled back at the last minute. So where they were about to finish the Germans off in Tunisia, after the Battle of Adi Akra, they got pulled out uh, to go back to England. And obviously in Germany, the Green Howards got pulled out before the ultimate surrender took place. You know, they were all for it to keep carrying on and do what was necessary. But I think they were always pulled out to go on to better things, I guess. Better things indeed. Th- thank you, Paul. Your father's wartime service is a fascinating story. If anyone would like to learn more of Bill's war, the book is Fighting Through from Dunkirk to Hamburg, a Green Howard's wartime memoir. I have a link on the website. Uh, there is also more pictures and information at fightingthrough.co.uk. And Paul has his own podcast, talking to veterans about their wartime experiences and uncovering unpublished memoirs. You can find that on iTunes, the Fighting Through podcast, or go to fightingthroughpodcast.co.uk. I have links on the website, www.podcast.com. For patrons of the show, I will have some extra bits of my conversation with Paul to share with you. Uh, But as of yet, I've not had the opportunity to put it together. So keep your eye out and expect that shortly. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Thanks for listening.